Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Valentine's Church, Loveland, Ohio. I'm glad to see all of your smiling, radiant, beaming, joyful faces this morning as we celebrate La Tere, or the Rejoice Sunday, which is the Sunday where we take a short break from the tedium of Lent. And here on this Sunday, we wear a festive rose. Uh, in my case, this beautiful garment was made by a, an East Asian underground nun, and it is pink. And so I am wearing a pink garment, not rose, but pink this morning, uh, in memory of the persecuted church in so many countries, especially in East Asia and in the subcontinent. And so this morning, as we continue to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we do so now in the liturgy of the word by remembering the words that he's spoken to us, and we turn our minds and our hearts back to God and hearing of the word. So I'd like to say these things to you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So today we have our first reading, the epistle, which is Galatians 4, 22 through 31. And in Galatians 4, we have a very clear story, a contrast built between the sons of promise and the sons of the will of man, the sons of the flesh. Those who are brought into the new covenant, which is through Jesus Christ, which is of God's will and of his perfect plan for us. And then the sons of the law, the sons of the flesh, those who are born of obligation and of duty, not of joy and rejoicing. So we have the story of Hagar, or as the scripture says here, Agar. And Hagar had a son to Abraham out of the law. She was the handmaiden of Sarah. And so because she was the handmaiden of Sarah, she was obligated to do those things that Sarah couldn't do. And Sarah could not bear a child. If you remember, there was a crisis of faith because God had told Abraham that he was going to have children like the sands of the sea, that his generation would be great. And yet Sarah was barren. She could not bear a child. And when she could not bear a child, what happened? She lost faith. She lost hope. And instead of believing the promise of God, what did she try to do? Of her own will, of her own volition, of her own desire, she had a baby by her handmaiden. And having the baby by her handmaiden, although it was a prevalent practice in the ancient Near East, was not God's perfect plan. That was not what God told Sarah to do. Instead, God told Sarah that she would have a child and that she would name that child what? Do you remember? Isaac. And what does Isaac mean? Isaac means laughter. So she was supposed to have a son of laughter a son of promise, a son of surprise, a son of good humor. And here she is not abiding by God's prophecy that he delivered to her himself, as we have up there in the icon of the hospitality of Abraham, those three angels that came and visited him and were entertained by Abraham, whom he called Lord, whom he called his Kyrios, his Lord. And what happened? Very clearly, it was that God wanted Sarah to obey, and she didn't. She did not believe. She did not believe, and because she did not believe, she thought of other ways to do God's will and work. And when you think of other ways to do God's will and work, other than what God has commanded, you make a mistake. You create a problem. And that problem that was created was an intergenerational strife between the Israelites and the Ishmaelites. And today, that same strife is playing itself out in the Middle East as the Ishmaelites, who are the Muslims, the Arabs, the Bedouins, are still in conflict with the children of Abraham. And we have this conflict worked out throughout all time for the last 3,000 years because of what? One woman's lack of faith. One woman's lack of faith led to a conflict that we still can't resolve today. So Abraham and Sarah didn't obey God. They didn't obey God. They didn't do what God told them to do. And they paid a very dreadful price. They bore a son, not of love, but of obligation, of duty. They bore a son, not of the joy of the Lord, but out of law. And these 
in the scripture here today, which is St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, are the two roles, the two contrasts, the two ways of doing religion that we see very clearly are very different. One is that people make you to do those things that please God. People make you to do those things that God has commanded. Your parents make you come to church. Your parents make you memorize Bible verses. Your parents make you do what is considered pious or respectable in their culture. And then the other, the child of joy, the one who receives the law of the Lord, not as law, but as love, that is the child of promise. And that child of promise is the one who receives all that God has for the child to receive with joy and with gladness and does it out of the grace and graciousness of their heart, out of the love that they experience from God, rather than as a duty, as a burden, as something that they'd rather not do or be burdened with. And this is so important for children who've been raised in Christian homes, because in Christian homes, we try to have you follow the ways of the Lord. We try to instill in you Christian virtues. We try to make you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. But what happens? Oftentimes, the child receives this instruction as a duty, as a burden, as something that they'd rather not do. And they rebel against it. They fight against it. They don't enjoy it. They don't like it. They don't rejoice in the Lord. And when that happens and they rebel against it, they experience their Christian heritage the love and covenant of the Lord that's been expressed in their family as what? As something negative, as something bad, as some tragic point of their history. And you can always know when you've met these kinds of people who grew up in a Christian home, but they're bitter about their upbringing. Because these people, they don't experience the joy of the Lord's presence. In fact, they are just overwhelmed with the negativity of all the rules and regulations. But this is not... A child of promise. This is not what God has commanded for us to receive in faith. This is not what we are as Christians supposed to be. We are as Christians supposed to be obedient, rejoicing, loving God for what he has expressed to us, his faithfulness to us, to all generations. And in receiving in faith, we receive his promise and thus become children of promise. In Galatians 4, the Apostle Paul makes a contrast between Mount Sinai, the gendereth in bondage, and Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that is now, as Paul says, the Jerusalem that is now. And in that contrast, he brings about a great difference. There is Hagar, there is Sarah, there is Sinai, there is Jerusalem. There is promise, which is received as the reward of joy that uh, is expressed in faith. The love that we have for God as our creator. We owe him everything and re receive everything from him as a gift. So that joy and gratefulness, that Eucharist that we express, constantly giving thanksgiving to God for all the innumerable benefits that he gives to us that we do not deserve. Or that child of bondage, that child of the law, who does not receive everything that God makes as a gift. And instead of being grateful, everything that is given, every commandment that is commanded of him becomes something that is a drag, is a drudge. Now, we are like Isaac, here Paul says. We are like Isaac. We are children of promise. We have been promised by God, and we have been reborn by the waters of baptism. In the waters of baptism, we have been reborn. And so, in being reborn, what happens? We all become children of promise. We all become children of the light. We all are no longer slaves, but free. We are no longer children of the bondwoman. We are children of the free woman. We are no longer filled with drudgery and hatred and uh, exasperation and a feeling of of chore, a feeling of, I'd rather this be over, a feeling that I would rather not do this, but someone's making me do it. Instead, we receive as children of the free woman, as children of the new covenant that God has established through Jesus Christ, as children of Jerusalem that descendeth from the heavenlies. We receive all things with grace and with joy and with gladness. And we say with our introit this morning, 
Rejoice, O Jerusalem! Rejoice and come together, all ye that love her. For Jerusalem is at unity with herself. What does it mean, Jerusalem is at unity with herself? Well, we see that now in the gospel. Because Jesus did an amazing miracle. One beautiful story about how God showed his love and grace, even for the little things, for the hungry stomachs of the people who were following Jesus in the wilderness. And here we see that Jesus was looking at 5,000 people who had followed him. 5,000. A number so large it's even hard to imagine. 5,000 of these people who had followed him into the wilderness, not including women and children. These 5,000 men and their families had followed Jesus, and they were now hungry. They had not eaten. They were very hungry and thirsty. And they felt like they were going to faint. The people were faint. Have you ever felt like you were going to faint? No. Fasting helps us to understand what that feels like. Because here in the Lenten season, when we skip meals, what happens? Well, you get faint. You get weak. You don't feel good. So Jesus saw that they were faint, that they were hungered, and he told his disciples that they should provide food. And the disciples were not full of faith. The disciples were skeptics. The disciples didn't know what was going on. They were disbelieving like Sarah was in the Old Testament story. They were disbelieving and they internally laughed at Jesus. Just like Sarah laughed at God's promise. They laughed at Jesus. They said, how can we do these things? And they were complaining to Jesus instead of believing in Jesus. They complained and they said that there was no way that Jesus could do these things. And they internally not only doubted, but they scoffed. They didn't think that Jesus was up to the task. They couldn't even imagine that Jesus could turn bread and fish out of thin air. There was no way that they could even conceive of these things. And so Philip answered to Jesus and said, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, and every one of them may just take a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. And what are they among so many? Now in this story, you have to realize how dynamic this is. We have Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He comes up to Jesus and he says, Now, there is hope. There is this little tiny meal that I've been able to locate. There is this little boy's lunch bag that he has two small fishes. We're thinking minnows here. We're thinking sardines here. Two small fishes and five small barley loaves, like five biscuits. Okay? So he has two sardines and five biscuits. But there's two little here. We couldn't possibly use them. And Andrew was curious. You can see from how the scripture describes his communication here with Jesus. He was holding on to a little hope that Jesus could do a lot with a very little. He had a small grain of faith, like a seed of mustard. He had a tiny little spark of faith in his heart that said, maybe Jesus can do something here. Maybe Jesus can save us. The little boy offered up his tiny sacrifice. And we know that if you have a faith like a little child, you can enter the kingdom of God. And here, this little boy had the faith of a little child. He had the faith to give Jesus his lunch, to give Jesus the two sardines and the five biscuits. And you know what happened? Jesus took those, and he had his disciples sit them on the ground, all of the 5,000 men and all of their families, and he blessed heaven. He thanked God. And in thanksgiving, in rejoicing, in rejoicing in what God had for him and the miracle that God was going to do because God is great and he loves us and he wants us to share in his bounty. In his gratefulness, in his graciousness for all of these things, the miracle was accomplished and no one even knew it. They couldn't even see the miracle going on because everyone was breaking the bread and passing it along. They couldn't see the miracle occurring. They couldn't see the bread multiplying. They couldn't see the fish multiplying. But in the end, what happened? Everyone was full. Everyone had what they needed from that tiny little sacrifice of a little boy with the faith of a child and of Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, who just had a tiny curiosity, a tiny inkling about what Jesus could do in this kind of dire situation. We see in this story something that's remarkable. That God does miracles in the midst of thankfulness, in the midst of gratefulness, 
in the midst of rejoicing. In rejoicing, rejoice, O Jerusalem. We have abundance. We have abounding. God provides for us what we do not have from tiny sacrifices as long as we rejoice. In our rejoicing, in our consolation, that in all suffering and all pain, we are experiencing the grace of God, the wonder of his miracles, the wonder of his work. We know that we can feed and help and meet the needs of all the people around us, even though we are insufficient in and of ourselves. In our sharing, in our breaking, in our giving over to one another, while we thank God, as Jesus did, lifting up our eyes to heaven and blessing God, asking God that he would be glorified in all these things, in doing what we should do, in thanksgiving, we are able to provide for the whole world through the church. So this is the message that I have for you this morning. The message that comes from our introit, message that comes from our communion hymn. Jerusalem is built as a city that is in unity with itself. For thither the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, to give thanks unto thy name, O Lord our God. Jerusalem is at unity with itself when we are giving thanks to God and breaking the bread and sharing with others. We bring all into the unity of the faith and into that one loaf, the one bread, the one body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which is the church, which is the new Jerusalem, which is ruled by our King. Rejoice, O Jerusalem. I've said these things to you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.